بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله بخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدع وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة ذنار أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولو أنما في الأرض من شجرة أقلام والبحر يمده من بعده سبعة أبحر ما نفدت كلمات الله إن الله عزيز حكيم this topic, brothers and sisters in Islam, is so vast and is so huge that it cannot possibly be covered in one hour. The entire creation, the entire universe is a witness to the kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king of kings and once we start discussing the magnificence the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his attributes his power his capacity we simply cannot imagine we cannot comprehend the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the minds which we have been given except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself reveals to us here in Surah Luqman, verse 27, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, He gives us a glimpse of the reality which will only be known to us by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever He wishes to reveal to us. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْمٍ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ No one will ever attain any knowledge except by His permission. So whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to reveal to us about Himself, He does so. Other than that, you can only speculate and your speculations will run out. Your mental capacity, your intellectual deliberations will never be able to encompass Allah's powers. Here in Surah Luqman verse 27, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if all the trees on the face of this planet, which run into billions, or trillions possibly. Only Allah knows the number. If all the trees were to be pens, and if seas were to be turned into ink, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's kalimat, His praise would never end. Your pens will break, your ink will run out, but His praise will never end. So this is a statement which in itself deserves a sitting of its own. But to give you a taste of this statement or a possible understanding of this statement, every single thing we do in this universe, on this planet, every single research or every single topic we study, is studied because of our observations. What we see, what we experience, what we taste, what we feel, and the list goes on. And every time we carry out or conduct researches into topics such as chemistry, biology, physics, history, archaeology, anthropology, you name it, the list goes on of these subjects. And every year, every 10 years or every decade a new subject comes out and our knowledge is increasing by the day to such an extent that we had 170 million documents collected in the British Library the British Library contains 170 million documents written by someone some way by some people and each document is unique in its approach and each document covers a topic. And all of these topics are based upon 
our observations, our study of the universe, our study of the natural phenomena. And where did all of this come from? This is the question. Whether we like it or not, we are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every time we pick up a stone, every time we pick up anything from this planet, from this universe, and start studying it, we are eventually, we are by extension, we are subsequently, inevitably studying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His power and the nature He has put around you. So all of this research in the British Library and in the Congress Library in America and whatever is in the other libraries in the world is the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He is the one who created all of this. He is the one who put all of this there for you to study and write on it. So when Allah says in the Quran that if all the pens were, or all the trees were to be pens, and all the seas were to be ink, your ink will run out, your pens will break, his kalimat, his praise will never end. You can write another 170 million documents, and add another 170 million on top of that. Until eternity, until this dunya ends, this life ends, you can keep writing, and whatever you write, you will be writing about what Allah has put here for you to write about. So His magnificence, His majesty is immense, which simply cannot be imagined. And whatever we learn, whatever we unearth, whatever we discover is by His mercy, by His blessings. So when our knowledge grows, it should only humble us. It should only humble us. And we should say, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. Glory be to the one who created all of this. The first verse of the Quran, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he told his companions, Ballighu anni walau aya, deliver from me, even if it may be a verse. Some people belittle this statement, not understanding the implications. Ballighu anni walau aya, deliver from me, even if it may be a verse. What does a verse mean? Some people think a verse, what is a verse? Verse is a statement. But a verse can mean everything you live and experience. For example, the first verse of the Quran. And by Allah, mankind to this day, collectively, hasn't sufficiently studied this one verse. And that verse is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah. All the praises are due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Now, Rabb is explained by the Mufassirun to mean the creator, the sustainer, the one who established this order we witness. And Alameen is everything and anything other than Allah. What we know, what we don't know and whatever we will never know is alameen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. And everything He created is part of alameen. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse in the Quran and when the Messenger of Allah said, Deliver for me, even if it may be a verse, some people think a verse means a verse. But a verse can mean all your life and what you have learnt and what you have studied and ad infinitum until the whole of mankind is studying it because alameen will never end you will learn something new every day I was reading a book on uh, cell there is a man in America he wrote a book titled signature in the cell and he's a biologist and he states that we learn something new about a cell every time we conduct extensive research into this phenomenon called cell. And we have millions of cells, trillions of cells running through our body. And this biology states that every time we conduct an extensive amount of research into cell, we find new things. And every time we find something new, we get baffled. Because the function of 
these tiny machines working within the cell is so specific and so purposeful. And it is designed to fulfill that purpose. And this is about a cell. People have spent their lives researching cells. And they are still learning more things about this cell. So what about this universe and whatever this universe contains? So your pen will break and your ink or all the seas will run out. Allah's praise will never end. His praise will never end. You can carry on and on and on. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Rahman, O oh mankind and jinn, penetrate the heavens if you can. You will not. You will not accept by his permission. Illa bi sultan. Accept by his permission. So when we go to Surah Rahman, which is one of the best surahs, the whole of the Quran is beautiful. But Surah Rahman is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to mankind and jinn in a way which is unique. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah, Ar Rahman. Who is Ar Rahman? The merciful. And only this particular verse or this particular term, we can carry on studying it and our lives will run out. Ar Rahman, the Mufassirun have explained Ar Rahman is all merciful in the sense that this mercy is for the believers and the disbelievers in this world. Ar Rahim is for the hereafter, for the believers alone. Because Allah has created this universe, and in this universe we find the believers and the disbelievers, and both the believers and the disbelievers take benefit from this universe, Allah is Ar-Rahman because He has given, He has allowed, He has permitted the disbelievers to enjoy this mercy until an appointed term. And when that term runs out, then Allah is Ar-Rahim on the Day of Judgment only for the believers. That mercy on the Day of Judgment is only for the believers. No mercy for the kuffar. No mercy for the ones who deny the signs of Allah which are in your face. And we will talk about them in due course inshaAllah. Allah's majesty and His kingship. And His kingship can be discussed in all the different aspects of His attributes and His qualities. Allah is a king when He forgives people. al ghufur Allah is a king when He punishes people. Shadeed al Allah is a king when he gives law to pe people, Al-Hakam, Allah is a king when he establishes justice, Al-Adl. Allah is a king in his unique sense when he is powerful and majestic, Al-Aziz, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbir, Al-Khaliq. All of these attributes are Allah's attributes and they are unique to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a king in all of these capacities. And none of the kings of this universe who lived in the past, who live today, and who will live in the future will ever match any of attri any attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone thinks that anyone has the attributes of Allah, such a person is a mushrik. We know this. So when Ibrahim salam was debating Nimrud, he said to him, My Lord gives life and he takes lives. The king was thick. This king was thick. He wasn't clever. He didn't understand the point Ibrahim salam was making. He's thinking Ibrahim is just saying, Oh, Allah gives life, my God gives life. Because he was a pagan king. He was a pagan. He thought like a pagan, a mushrik. He said, Okay, bring two criminals. And the one who was due to be killed, he said, go free, ya Allah, you're free to go. And the other one who was due to be released, kill him. There you go. I can give life and I can take life. Ibrahim salam realized that this man, his brain is twisted. Then he said to him, that he had to break it down for him. My God, my Allah, my Lord, my Rabb, brings the sun out of the east and he takes it down in the west. 
you do the same. His tongue, he had no more arguments. He had nothing to say. He was dumbstruck. What am I going to say to this now? How am I going to do this? This is Allah's kingship. As a creator, as a lord, the real king, the king of the kings. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Rahman Al-Rahman, His mercy is for this universe, as long as we are alive, as long as this universe lasts, and there is an appointed term. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was approached by Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu when he was in the house in his house the Prophet of Allah was lying in a lying position on his mat made of palm leaf and on his back there were marks and he lived such a simple life and Umar bin Khattab according to some reports he cried he said Ya Rasulullah the kings and the emperors of Persia they enjoy their lives they have all this pomp and glitter and glory. You the messenger of Allah, the best person to walk the face of this planet. Whoever lived. You live in this state. And when the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa heard this, he got up, sat down, and he said, Umar, if this dunya was more worthy in the sight of Allah than a mosquito's wing, Allah would never give a cup of water to a kafir from this dunya. For us is the hereafter. The point here is that in this dunya, people are reaping the benefits of the mercy of Ar-Rahman. So when you see a kafir driving a Ferrari and going to a nightclub at, a night, at night and he's got two women on his sides and he's got a bottle in his hand and he's having fun enjoying his life or he goes to Ibiza or he goes to Tenerife and he listens to trance and drum and bass and house and all the rubbish and he has a spliff as well in his hand some brothers some people think some youngsters oh subhanallah he's, that's the life man he's living a life he's enjoying his time well, is that the life is that the life this is an appointed term they have been given this freedom as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in surah al tariq that they have an appointed term, some time. Give them that time. Give them that time to enjoy their lives. And they will see in the hereafter. So this mercy which Allah has left in this dunya, and this dunya is a test for us, it is for both the believers and the kuffar. But in the hereafter, Allah is ar rahim only for the believers. And this is how this surah begins, Ar-Rahman. Allah is making His case to mankind. Ar-Rahman, that's why Allah begins the surah in this way. Ar-Rahman, for both of you, not only humans, Muslims and kuffar, believers and kuffar, jinns too. فَبِأَيِّ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانَ Which of your Lord's favors will you both deny? The mankind, mankind and jinn. عَلَّمَ Quran. Now Allah is merciful for all of you, put together collectively. He has given you the Qur'an. He has taught you the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is the ultimate, the epitome of Allah's mercy, the manifestation of His mercy. He's making a point. This is the best thing for you. Al-Qur'an. Allama al-Qur'an. Khalaq al-insan. Allamahu al-bayan. Insan was created. And he was taught how to talk by this Lord of yours who is great in his majesty. And then he gives the signs of his kingship. He establishes his case in front of these people, mankind and jinn together collectively. That he is merciful, he has given you the Quran, he has created you and... All the creation is in submission to him. The sun and the moon are running according to an appointed system. Hisab. There is calculated system for the sun and the moon. Now, here, sometimes people think what the kings can do and the power the kings have 
and the majesty they, 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 they possess. Something to think about. How many kings, just like Ibrahim salam, spoke to the king, Nimrod, debated with him, told him, my God gives life and he takes life. Yes? One of the first arguments, he said, I can do that. Then he gave him the knockout punch, as we say in debating, yeah? He can bring the sun out of the west and he take it, uh, sorry, from the east, take it down in the west. Can you do that? Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he begins with the surah, he says, insan." Allah created man. And he taught him bayan, the speech. And then, الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ hasban, Which no king on the face of this earth before, today, and in the future will be able to do. Never. What does this mean? الشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرُ hasban, The sun and the moon are there in a calculated system. They function according to a calculated system. They are finely tuned. Their design is so perfect that only a king who is powerful enough to do it can do it. And only Allah is powerful enough to do it. Powerful enough to do it. The sun, some of the astrophysicists tell us, is millions of miles away. They have estimated. Millions of miles away. And if the sun was to move away from its constant, few inches back, few inches, we're talking about few inches, not feet, not meters, few inches back, we would freeze to death. And if the sun was to be moved forward, few inches, we would burn to death. الشمس والقمر بحسبان Sun and the moon are there in a calculated way, they have been placed and their placement has been calculated. This is your Lord who did this. Put the sun there for you to receive the exact amount of heat, the exact amount of light, the exact amount of radiations necessary for your existence. And Allah has made all of this for you to see and realize His majesty and His power and His capacity to the best of your abilities. Today these are the kuffar, the kuffar astrophysicists, most of them are kuffar, they're telling you this. That the sun is there and it's been placed perfectly well for our existence. If it was to be moved away a few inches, we would freeze to death. And this is true. And you know one of those flares which comes out of the sun every second, when the sun is, sun is a burning ball of fire, millions of miles away, and its size cannot be imagined, you don't have the mind, you don't have the tools, you don't have the capacity to measure the size of the sun. You can only estimate. And one of those flares emerging from the sun, every single second, listen carefully, pay attention. These are again estimates. But it will give you an idea about the majesty and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of those flares, emerging from the sun, when the sun is burning continuously, is equal to, pay attention, is equal to 200 billion atomic bombs. Can you imagine this energy? I'm asking a question. Can you imagine this energy? Sorry? It's impossible. Impossible to? Imagine. imagine. It's impossible to imagine. You don't have the tools to imagine such energy. Maybe 10 atomic bombs or 50 or 100 would be enough for this planet. Those which were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 200 billion, not 1, 2, 3, 5, 10, 20, 100, or 1,000, or 100,000. 200 billion atomic bombs. One of those flares emerging from the sun. And when Allah talks about Jahannam in the Quran, and when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, tells about the creation of Jahannam, when they were sitting in Medina, they heard a loud bang. And they shook. Ya Rasulullah, what was that? And the Messenger of Allah told them, this was a stone which was thrown into hellfire 70 years ago and reached its pit now. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The Sahaba, they were shaken by this. Such an immense place. 
people think, subhanAllah, some of these rationalists think, how is that possible? Well, who is asking you to even think, how is that possible? Just look at the sun and try to measure the size of the sun. And the day you have the calculations, and the, the day you can take a calculation, an accurate calculation of the energy of the sun, then talk to us. And explain it to us rationally. And if you cannot, and you will not, then fear the fire. Then fear the fire. And fuel for this fire will be men and stones. Men and stones. This is the majesty. This is our powerful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is who has put the sun and the moon in a calcul calculated way for you to see his signs. One najmu was shajru yasjudan. And all the stars and all the trees are bowing to him. They are in submission to him. They bow to him. And he's the one who's, who has put them there for you to look at. There are trillions and billions of stars. You will never have the calculators to count these stars and the trees you have on the face of this earth. You will never have the calculators to count them. And he has made the sky, he has raised the sky, and he has made balance therein. Now, this verse, again, if you start thinking about it, the power of Allah, the kingship of Allah, the majesty of Allah, no king can ever do this and explain things to the, you in this way, in such a calculated way. Here Allah is telling you that Allah has raised the heavens and there is balance there. You know Isaac Newton, if you are sincere and if you want to know the truth, the truth is apparent. Isaac Newton, studying in the 17th century and he died in the early 18th century. People think he was a deist. Deist is someone who believes in a supreme power, who doesn't take an active role or an active part in the running of this universe. So Isaac Newton is mistakenly thought to be a deist. But he wasn't a deist. He was a theist. He believed in God. And you know what led, to, led him to this God? His science, not his Christianity. He was a scientist. He's known for his science. He was a physicist. And he wrote extensive amount of works on physics. But he wrote even more on theology. Almost three million words were left behind by him in, his, in manuscripts, which can be found in different libraries in the world and different private collections. People have bought his collections and his uh, manuscripts. In his works, he wrote that this God who created this universe, created it in a calculated way. He was a master mathematician. Now, I'm not saying what you were saying is true. This is what he's thinking and learning in the 16th, 17th century. And he is looking for the origin of this universe. And he realized the majesty of this king who had put the system there. And he was led to this conclusion by his science, his study of nature. He said, this was a master mathematician. Whoever put the universe the moon and the star and the earth and the solar system there was a master mathematician. Everything is calculated and is balanced, finely tuned, is balanced. And he is one. He has to be one. Because there is only one will behind all of this. One intention, one mind, one power behind all of this. And he is unique. He is unique. And he is an active player in the running of the universe because the way the system works and the way it's been working for thousands of years, someone has to be behind for the system to continue running like a clock. And then there are other things he believed in. He even believed that Jesus will return and he will get rid of the Christian religion we have today, the Trinitarianism. He is the one who will come back and he will fight Trinitarianism. Allahu Akbar. Yani this is Islam. This is what Rasulullah taught us. That when Isa will come back, he will break the cross. 
He'll kill the Dajjal. Yes? And Isaac Newton is writing this. Wallahi, I believe that if he had Islam, or if he studied Islam, he would have embraced Islam, no problem. Because whatever he wrote was Islam. So he was a Muslim without Islam. Allah alam, Allah alam, whether he was a Muslim or not. But he was a theist, he was not a Trinitarian. He believed in only one God who was unique and powerful and majestic. And he wrote this very clearly. So if you are sincere and if you want to study nature, you will see the majesty of this king of the kings. And you will see what he can do, others cannot do. And if that much is established to you, by looking at five verses of the Qur'an, randomly pick up the Qur'an, start reading the Qur'an and start contemplating. أَفَلَا يَتَدَّبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتَلَافًا كَثِيرًا Do you not even ponder upon the Qur'an? If there, were if there were any discrepancies in it, then it would have been from someone else. If, it was from, if it's from Allah, then you would have found discrepancies in it, which you don't find in it. Pick up the Qur'an randomly and start reading and imagine, imagine what Allah is trying to tell you in the Qur'an, the way He's speaking to you. His kingship will be established in no time. And He gives you examples in the Qur'an of those who denied, who rejected His power and His kingship. He got rid of them. أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَاد إِرَمَ ذَاتِ الْعِمَادِ أَلَّتِي لَمْ يُخْلَقْ مِثْلُهَا فِي الْبِلَادِ وَثَمُودَ الَّذِينَ جَابُوا الصَّخْرَ بِالْوَادِ وَفِرْعَوْنَ ذِي الْأَوْتَادِ أَلَّذِينَ تَغَوْا فِي الْبِلَادِ These people, they were very very powerful. You think you have power? You, the Americans and the British and the Germans, you think you have power? You have nothing. You have nothing. You don't have any power. You're just a bunch of people pressing buttons and you've attained this technology and this is not power. Power is these people who we created in the past. They were powerful. None of them or no one was created the way, like them. They used to carve mountains. They used to carve mountains with hands. Has anyone been to Petra? Jordan. You've been to Jordan? Petra? Okay, Petra? No. Petra. Okay, how many brothers have been to British Museum here? One brother, mashallah. Who else? I'm not saying it's part. But I'm asking. Hmm? No one? You know the Muslims in the past were the torchbearers of knowledge and enlightenment. They were the most learned people on the face of the earth. And this was because they were aware of their surroundings. Today, unfortunately, we don't pay much attention to our surroundings. We have become individualistic. We sit at home, enjoy our lives with our families, and don't really do much about our knowledge and enlightenment. Allah told you in the Quran, Siru fil ard, Fanduru kayfa kana aqibatul il Go in the land and see what happened to those who denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see, you will realize His Majesty, and you will see what happened to the kings of this world. And what, when you see that the kings of this world perish with their majesty, with their power and pomp and glitter in their court and the armies, then there is only one king here. There is only one real king here who is governing you and those kings. Go and see those Babylonian inscriptions, those Assyrian inscriptions. You know those kings? Wallahi, when you look at them, the power they had, subhanallah, you think, these are the people who governed this land before? This is why Allah wants you to see them. Go and see what happened to them. You know, some of the beds, you know, they used to be really strong guys. You know, when you look at the inscriptions, go to the British Museum. Next time you go to London, do not miss this opportunity. Go for one purpose, to remind yourselves of Allah and His power and His majesty and His kingship. Go to the museum for this reason and see what happened to the kings before. See what happened to the king of Pharaoh, or Yani Musa alayhi salam. Ramsi the second. His mummy is there. His mummy is there in the Cairo Museum. You cannot see it in the British Museum, but other mummies are there in the British Museum. You can see them. 
But this king, he is there. And in Surah Yunus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 90, that today you believe when he was drowning. Say, I believe in the Lord of Musa. The death is in front of my face now. What am I going to do? I believe in his Lord. Allah said, now you believe. All your life you were haughty and proud. Now taste death. And your body will be preserved for the future generations to come and see and take lessons. His body is there. Majority of archaeologists and scholars, historians believe that this is Ramses II who was the king of Musa a.s. He's almost seven feet tall. He's there, his body is there. The real thing is there. And people see it. King of this world. Very powerful king. There are still stellars in Egypt in its praise. The king of the world. Fulan and Fulan. The conqueror of Israel. The conqueror of the Nubians. The conqueror of the world. The conqueror of the Assyrians. Look at the, 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 the list goes on. And go and look at the conqueror of the Assyrians and the Nubians and the Israelis. It's there. Dead. Can't do nothing. Powerless. Ana rabbukum al-a'la. This is what he said, right? This is what he claimed. Ana rabbukum al-a'la. I am the great Lord. I am the Lord, the highest. And Allah showed you. This is a Lord, the one who claimed to be the highest. Here, mummified. And go and see the Babylonians and Assyrians in the British Museum. You know these kings, some of them, they used to hunt, they used to kill lions with hands. They used to kill lions with hands. And when you look at their, you know, forearms, they were as big as your legs. And these are not exaggerated scriptures. These are realistic. These kings used to hunt lions. And there were lions in Syria at the time. They were killed off because the jungles were cut off by the Romans. And then later on, even at, uh, at the time of Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, there were lions in Syria. So, you can see in those inscriptions, the king is actually, he's... he's holding on to a lion and trying to kill a lion and there are uh, many arrows in the body uh, of the lion and the king when you look at him he's got a very nice long beard and you know it's all plaited up and uh, got a lot of you know even gems on the beards the tails of the horses were plaited these are sophisticated these people were we think we're intelligent we have all that we are nothing in comparison to those people they did everything manually Tell me how they build the pyramids. Go on, explain to me. How did they build the pyramids? Allah is telling you there was no one who was created like them. And what happened to them? Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbu kabi'ad iramadatil imad allati lam yukhlak mithluha fil bilad wa thamud alladhina jabu sakhra bilwad wa fir'auna dil awtad What happened to them? What happened to them? Where are they? Go and see. And then when you see them, when you see them, you will realize there's only one king. There's only one king. King of kings. King of kings. And much more can be said in this regard. Ikhwan and Akhawat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am too little to cover this topic. My knowledge is too limited. I am not deserving of talking about this topic. I'm only doing my best to explain certain things which I understand from nature. And the rest belongs to Allah, all praises are due to Allah, and we cannot possibly put together all of mankind can praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala according to His Majesty. We cannot. We do our best. We do our best. Wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, we should only fear Allah. Because a lot of people here, we sacrifice our deen, fearing the people. Yes. The brother is making a point that because Allah is the most powerful being, Allah is the one who determines the outcomes of uh, affairs, then who should we fear? People or Allah? Because some people sometimes sell their deen because they fear people. Sometimes because of fear, sometimes because of greed, sometimes because of other things. But if you truly believe that Allah is the king of kings, Allah is the most powerful being ever imagined, then Allah has power 
to change your affairs often overnight. If you stand by Islam, if you stand firmly on this deen and not compromise and not sell your deen for pity gains, then Allah can benefit you in ways you cannot imagine because He is the King. So if you truly believe in His power and His majesty, none of the kings of this world will ever be able to harm you. Rasulullah told Abdullah bin Abbas, Ya Ghulam, Oh young man, listen, if the whole of this universe gets together, they cannot harm you except what Allah has decreed for you. And if they get together to benefit you, all of them, they cannot benefit you except what Allah has decreed for you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم تعدون Those who say Allah is my Rabb and they are firm on that ثم ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة Allah sends angels upon them who tell them fear not grieve not as your abode is Jannah you are born in Jannah. You got nothing to worry. A Muslim, a believer has nothing to lose. A believer is never in a loss. A believer is never in a state of loss. When a musiba, a trouble comes his way, he says, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. When something comes, good comes his way, he says, Alhamdulillah. There's nothing wrong, ever wrong with a believer. A believer can never be depressed. A believer can be in pain, but never be depressed. You will never find a believer who is depressed. Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal was brought in front of Mu'attasim Billah, one of the Abbasid kings, a very strong, powerful man. Such a powerful man that the Byzantines, the Romans, used to pay him tax. And the Roman emperor used to wee in his pants. Excuse the French. <laughs> you know when he used to wear hear his name. Harun al-Rashid, you know, how he used to talk to the Roman king, the emperor, he wrote a letter to him. Because the Roman emperor taunted the Khalifa, he said to him, Ila min Amir al-Mu'mineen Harun Rashid, Ila Kalbir Rome. From the leader of the believers, Harun Rashid, to the dog of Rome. This is how he used to talk to, these people are nothing, they, what can they do? It is Allah who does everything. Mu'tasim Billah was a very strong guy. There are reports about him that he, used, when he used to strike someone with a sword, the sword used to go as far as the waist. And he brought Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal Khafif, thin man, a scholar of hadith, a very humble, thin man. Okay, Shaykh, why don't you listen to us? Why don't you submit? Why don't you give up? Why don't you say what we are saying? This was an issue of doctrine, aqidah. And Imam Ahmed said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin. Give me something on the Quran or the Sunnah, I will submit. I will listen to what you have to say. But if you don't have nothing on the Quran and Sunnah, bring what you want. Then Mu'tasim Billah to terrorize the Imam. To drive terror into his heart, brings two people and execute them in front of him. He tells his executioners, kill them, kill them in front of him. And now the message is, you are next. You are next. And what does this man do? Because he, he is a servant of hadith. An imam. An imam of such caliber that to this day, his collection is the largest collection of hadith on the face of the earth. Musa Ahmad. Is that correct, Sheikh? There were bigger collections, but they've been lost. 28,000 hadith is survived because he was sincere. He was not a king. He was not a caliph or an emperor. He was a very thin, miskeen, humble, weak man physically. But spiritually, he was as strong as a mountain. So the Khalifa couldn't shake him. When these two men were executed in front of him, he turned to the man sitting next to him, a student of Imam Shafi'i. He said to him, what was the opinion of Imam Shafi'i about wiping over the socks? <laughs> Allahu Akbar. This man is about to die. You know, when you think you've been ex you're going to be executed in the next 5-10 minutes, whatever, yeah? Do you think you would be thinking about wiping, wiping over socks? Do you think you would be thinking about your ghusl or your wudu or your salah? Of course, unless you have iman. Unless you have iman. But this man is 
so worry free he doesn't care what Mu'tasim is going to do or what the executioner is going to do I want to learn even in this time what was the opinion of him? before he loses the opportunity because he was going back to the prison okay so here is a student of Imam Shafi what was his opinion about socks wiping over them subhanallah these people they couldn't defeat him they perished Mamun died Mu'tasim died Wathiq Billah died all of these Khulafa, three of them who were torturing him, persecuting him, died, perished. But the fourth one who came to power, he came to apologize. He said, Imam, please forgive me and my ancestors. They were wrong. This is Tawakkal. They believed in the power of Allah. Imam Ahmad believed in the power and the majesty and the kingship of Allah. That's why he wasn't shaken. So those who truly believe in Allah's power, his kingship, his majesty, will never submit to any pressure. Doesn't matter. Bring mountains. One of the sheikhs who was imprisoned in Egypt, the Egyptian authorities, now they are paying the price. They said to the sheikh that we will bring your wife. If you don't talk, we will bring your wife. He said, you know what? Bring my mother with my wife. Bring my mother with my wife. Do what you want. They were shocked. <laughs> They're thinking, well, how do we break this man? How do we break this man? May Allah preserve him, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him Jannah, sacrifices. So, there are people on this planet who would never shake. They wouldn't compromise or anything because they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us one of those. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from his tests. Ameen.